All right, everybody. Thanks for join us, joining us today for Cafe Conversations. I am Elizabeth Vaughn, the Associate Senior Director of Philanthropy in the College of Agriculture. And we are excited to have Dr. Amanda Gumbert with us today. Amanda's going to talk to us about water quality across Kentucky um, and our waterways. And so we do have everyone on mute. Um, you are welcome to use the chat function to submit questions at any point. And Amanda will address those at the end of the presentation. Um, and without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over. All right, well, good afternoon, everybody. And thanks for being here. Um, happy day after World Water Day. Uh, we're, um, we are celebrating Water Week in um, Kentucky this week as well. So. I um, appreciate you being here and learning more about our waterways in Kentucky. I'm going to go ahead and I'll share my screen and we'll get started. So you can see my slides okay? Okay, excellent. Great. So again, I'm Amanda Gumbert and I'm an Extension Specialist for Water Quality here at the UK College of Agriculture, Food and Environment. And so that just means that um, I like to play in the water and um, I serve the entire state of Kentucky. So um, providing education and outreach opportunities to adults, to um, kids as well. And uh, so we're just gonna get an overview today a little bit about Kentucky's water resources, some problems and challenges that we might see in our waterways. And then um, also um, a few simple things that we all can do to make our water better. So I want to start out with um, this quote from Luna Leopold, and you may be familiar with Aldo Leopold. Um, Aldo Leopold is uh, fairly well known as a naturalist and um, conservationist, and Luna was his son. And um, this quote um, comes from several years back, but I think it is um, really um, appropriate and applicable still today. And it says that water is the most critical resource issue of our lifetime and our children's lifetime. The health of our waters is the principal measure of how we live on the land. And I think that's very true. And um, it's, you know, everything that we do on the land impacts our water quality. So I'm going to start out by showing you a map of Kentucky's river basins. And these are um, the major watersheds um, here in Kentucky. So each color is a different watershed. Um, hopefully you can find yourself or maybe at least you see Lexington there in the Kentucky River Basin. Um, and that's where, of course, the university is located. Um, and so each of these are our major river basins or major watersheds. And that just means that all of the water within that same colored area drains to a common location. And then that water then, uh, most of it uh, flows right into the Ohio River or um, four rivers, some of that goes straight to the Mississippi River. And so ultimately our water does get to the Gulf of Mexico. So Kentucky has over 90,000 miles of streams and rivers. Um, and that's a lot. And um, sometimes folks like to brag and say that we have, uh, we're second only to Alaska in number of stream miles and rivers, but there are a couple of other states that like to compete for those bragging rights too. But suffice to say that we have a lot of streams and rivers. And we also have over 440,000 acres of lakes in Kentucky. And so we have plenty of water most of the time. Sometimes we have too much. Um, but we do have, we are usually have uh, water quality issues versus water quantity issues. And if you go um, to the Western part of the United States, that's where we get into water quantity issues more so than here in Kentucky. Now I wanna show you um, a, 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 a table of data and I will say that this is as data heavy as this talk is gonna get. So don't get nervous if you're like not a numbers person um, but what I wanted to show you is some data that comes from the Kentucky Division of Water. They are the regulatory agency here in Kentucky that is responsible for reporting the quality of water that we have in the state back to Congress. And so they put out a report every two years and, um, and so that data is available publicly. 
Um, and you see it, this is from 2014 and the 2016 reports. And I know you're thinking, gosh, that's kind of old data by now. Um, but that, those are the most recent ones that I could get a hold of. They come out on a two year cycle. And so in 2020 was when the 2018 should have been released. And of course, 2020 was um, a little bit mucky for everybody. So we don't have that data quite yet. Um, but what I want you to look at is are the categories. And so what this is saying is that we have designated uses for our streams. So our streams are designated uses. Most of them in Kentucky are designated for aquatic life. And that means the bugs, the critters, all the stuff that we go and look for when we get into a creek and we turn the rocks over and we look for those little critters, crayfish, mayflies, stoneflies, um, uh, water pennies, all those little critters, those are the things that we're looking for with aquatic life because those things are going to support a larger food web in that system as well as downstream. Primary contact recreation, that's swimming or anytime the water might get in our mouth or our nose or ears or eyes. Um, secondary contact recreation is when we're fishing or wading or boating. And of course, fish consumption, pretty obvious. Domestic water supply, when we're taking our drinking water from a water body. And then the final category is outstanding state resource water. And so some of our streams are just incredibly healthy and really um, important for us to protect. And so those are called outstanding state resource waters. But what the data says is that in 2014 and in 2016, the numbers we reported um, is that, you know, Thinking about 90,000 miles of streams, we're not able to monitor all of those. So we're looking at a small fraction of streams that were actually tested. But of those that were tested, we're looking around 50 to 60% of those both years there that were impaired for aquatic life, which means they weren't healthy enough for aquatic life to be supported. Dropping down the, to the next slide where we look at primary contact recreation, um, 71 and 79 percent of those streams were not healthy enough for us to swim in them if they were indeed big enough to swim in. So um, a lot of us, you know, grew up especially wading and, and maybe swimming in our streams and rivers and lakes. Um, and so now maybe it's not such a great idea. Um, and the reason being our, is bacteria. And we're concerned with bacteria when we're swimming because that could get into our mouth or nose. We can ingest it and that can make us sick. Um, when we look at secondary contact recreation, um, a lower number there because there's more tolerance for bacteria um, in terms of if you're fishing or wading or boating, you're not as likely to submerge your body in the water. So there's a, there's a higher tolerance for bacteria there. Um, fish consumption, around 60% of those streams that were monitored um, did not meet um, the, the preliminary um, assessment need for fish consumption. The good news is that all of the systems that were monitored did meet domestic water supply criteria if they were indeed water supplies. So I show you this not to, to, you know, to be a bummer and say, oh my gosh, our water is terrible. It's just that this portion of our monitored streams did have some problems. And so, you know, we start to look at that on a whole. I think Kentucky has some great water resources. We just have to do a good job of taking care of those. The causes of pollutants that were in these waterways, um, primarily pathogens. So we're talking about bacteria here, um, sediment. Um, so, and we'll talk a little more about sediment and then nutrients, so nitrogen and phosphorus. And so those are the things that are causing problems to our streams when there's too much that gets in. Now, I would be remiss if I talked about water in Kentucky and didn't mention karst topography. And karst is um, just a, a fancy way to say we've got a lot of caves, um, springs, sinkholes um, and in, in our landscape. And that often means we have shallow soils that cover over um, those cave systems or um, our springs and sinkholes. So there's a high probability that we could get um, contamination in our groundwater from, from the land use that we have on the surface. So basically it just means lots of surface water, groundwater interaction. And this map really shows us the darker the blue here, the more likely we are to have areas of karst topography. So um, 
central Kentucky has that big ring, you know, that, that's, that concentration of karst geology, and then also, of course, in the western part of the state. So if you're from that area, you know it's sinkhole country and cave country, and um, of course, we have Mammoth Cave in that area as well. So again, what we do on the surface of the land can quickly impact our groundwater resources. And so this is just an example of what we call a swallow hole or a swallet. Um, and it's a sinkhole that's located in the body of a stream. And so anything that's running into that stream has the probability of getting into that sinkhole and entering the groundwater system. So the reminder here and the take home message is if it's on the ground, it's in your water. And so we'll remind you of that as we move through the program today. Um, so let's talk about these main challenges that we have for our streams in Kentucky. Um, and, you know, I've talked about those top three pollutants, sediment, pathogens, nutrients. But I added volume here because especially recently, um, we had lots of water and lots of localized flooding in Kentucky. And so um, as we see greater um, volumes in our rain events, and I know people give me a hard time for calling, you know, when it rains a rain event, when did it become an event? Well, when we get lots of water in a short period of time, I would call that a pretty big event. So we're going to talk about volume too. So volume becomes a challenge because as we develop our landscapes, we have more and more impervious surface. So that means we have streets, roads, buildings, pavement of any kind that's going to prevent water from getting into the soil. And so we, you know, when it rains, we like for our water to infiltrate into our soil. It helps to recharge groundwater and, and it's also a great storage uh, area for, for precipitation. And so um, I like to ask this question and with these virtual events, it's a little hard to do that. But so think about what happens when it rains. So where you live, think about what happens uh, when you have heavy rainfall or even, even a light uh, rain in your neighborhood or you know, where you drive around. So the image on the left shows um, natural ground covering. So we're talking about trees, shrubs, grasses, you know, um, perennials, any kind of greenery. Um, we can get up to 50% of, of the volume of rainfall that will infiltrate into the soil. We'll lose about 40% to evapotranspiration, but then we only have about 10% that's gonna run off. And so that's in a natural setting. If we look to the right, and this is a, um, an urban area or a developed landscape where we have 75 to 100% impervious cover, that means something covering a hard surface covering the ground, we're not going to get that same amount of infiltration because there's just not the surface area of, of exposed soil or grass or trees. And so we can get up to 55% of runoff. So we were at 10% on the left. Now we're over at 55%. So you can see this increase in volume of water that has to go somewhere. And so we start to see, you know, this is an older neighborhood um, here in Fayette County, but um, you see kind of how we start to treat our streams and in urban areas, especially. We build our homes and we say, you know what, stream, you're gonna stay in your banks and we're gonna build a little box for you to flow in. And so yes, that, that little box does hold the water during a rain event, but it, really doesn't supply a lot of ecology or benefit to the landscape other than getting the water off of, of the surface or out of that area. So if you're an engineer and you're on the call, my apologies, because I know your goal is to get water from point A to point B in the most efficient way possible. However, I'm looking at it too from an ecological standpoint. You know, how are we treating our water? How are we treating our landscape? and you know what happens to that water but this is what happens so let's move on to um, the next challenge and that is sediment in our streams and so these are some images that um, you know where we see um, sediment or, or soil particles that are getting into the water body um, sediment can come from lots of different places but anytime we've got bare soil then we have a chance to lose sediment into the stream 
The problem with sediment is that it's going to drop into the stream bank and then we start to suffocate and cover up the habitat. Remember those stream critters? Those are the things that you like to go and look for in the, in the stream and, and catching crayfish or crawdads or whatever you want to call them. Um, when we, and mussels especially, suffer from sediment um, dropping over on it. So when we have that kind of chocolate milk looking um, water flowing in our rivers, as that sediment drops down to the bottom, it's going to suffocate any type of habitat that we might have there. So construction, of course, is a big culprit for um, erosion. Um, but one thing that we may not think about a lot are just our actual stream banks themselves. So the image at the bottom left is um, a pasture setting where um, livestock had full access to the stream. And over time, their foot traffic of going in and out of the creek um, starts to erode away that bank and make it um, exposed to erosion with a high velocity of volume. So when we combine the volume as well as um, unarmored or unprotected stream banks, then we see the more likelihood for erosion. Tillage is also something um, that can contribute to soil loss. And so in agriculture, we promote things like using cover crops or um, no-till practices. And we have lots and lots of no-till acres here in Kentucky. Um, and so those are good practices for holding our soil in place because we don't want to send our soil downstream. We want to keep it here where it can do what it's supposed to do. Uh, and here's a, an image of an old pasture field that um, was previously grazed or mowed to the edge of the stream. Um, and then we start to see the influence of erosion um, as the runoff moves down this channel. So we're losing soil off of that stream bank. Um, here's an urban um, setting situation where there was a construction site um, up the street from um, this location. And again, one of these heavy rainfall events, you know, a couple of inches in a very short period of time. And so we lose sediment from that construction site. As, so now we have volume and we have sediment. So the next thing we'll talk about um, are pathogens. And so again, that's bacteria or viruses. Um, and these pathogens get into our waterways from a variety of sources. Um, primarily though, in, in urban situations, you would think, gosh, well, we have sanitary sewers, um, that's gonna take care of it. Um, but unfortunately, we have failing sanitary sewers in urban areas, and we have failing septic systems in rural areas. Um, and so unfortunately, um, but that's just what happens. So when we have infrastructure that is really not adequate, then we start to see discharges of human waste into our streams and rivers. Um, livestock are another source of um, bacteria getting into streams and rivers, either by um, what we would consider direct deposit, if you know what I mean, or um, in situations where we maybe are doing manure applications too close to a stream and we lose those um, with surface runoff um, moving into the, to the water body. Wildlife are also a contributor. Um, sometimes wildlife gets the blame in some watersheds where maybe it's really not the wildlife, but in, in some urban settings as well as rural, um, wildlife, especially um, Canada geese, um, can really be major contributors to pathogens as well as nutrients. They are, they are really pooping machines, if you know what I mean. So um, the next challenge that we'll talk about are nutrients. And so this is one that I work on a lot. Um, and you know, we think about nutrients and, and we think, gosh, nutrients are good, right? They're good for us. We're, we're told from early on, we should eat nutritious diets and that's gonna make us healthy and strong. Um, but what happens is that you can get too much nutrients, especially in terms of streams and water quality. And so this is when we get excess fertilizer going into, um, into the water. And that can come from a variety of places. It can come from um, urban settings, of course. And this is the time of year where if you're walking around your neighborhood, you're probably seeing people out with their little fertilizer buggy walking around. Maybe you're seeing some of those granules on the sidewalk. Um, and so if we're not using a soil test to determine what our nutrient needs are, then we can over apply fertilizer. 
And so, you know, in agricultural settings, this can happen too. Maybe it's applied at the wrong time or in the wrong place. Um, most of the time, our large scale um, crop producers can't afford to over apply. So oftentimes, um, they're going to use um, a soil test to determine what they need and, and hopefully use that and go by that guideline. Um, animal manure is another source of excess nutrients and um, that can, and can be uh, pretty prominent. Um, we've got a lot of animals in Kentucky and we're coming out of winter feeding. Um, there's still some probably little remains of winter left and, and so we're still going to have to have winter feeding. And when we congregate animals um, and we have this concentration of manure, a lot of times we can have runoff from that. Um, also, um, we can have another source of animal manure that you might not think about are pets. And so thinking about pet waste and the concentration and number of pets that, that we have um, in Kentucky and really across the United States, it can be a contributor of excess nitrogen and phosphorus getting into um, our waterways. Uh, human wastewater, again, when we talked about failing septic and um, sanitary sewer systems, we can, not only are we getting bacteria, but we're also getting nutrients. And of course, um, wildlife as well. Um, this other graphic um, on the right, on the bottom right, I wanted to just point out um, back to human wastewater, um, not only when we have failing systems, but also our, our um, working treatment systems also can contribute nutrients into our waterways. So when we flush um, in urban set settings, we have sanitary sewer systems, they take all of that wastewater to a treatment plant. That treatment plant goes through all the treatment stages and then that treated water is released back into a stream, river, or lake. And there are, you know, there's a certain level of nutrients that are still in that water. And so um, just knowing that that can also be a source of nutrients getting into our streams and rivers. So when I talk about nutrients, I always think about the Mississippi River as a whole. Um, and so the map on the left shows you the, the entirety of the Mississippi Atchafalaya River Basin. So all those different colored blocks are what I would call a sub watershed of the Mississippi River Basin. So we're there in the purple in the Ohio River Basin. Well, at least those of us in Kentucky, you might not be in Kentucky right now, but um, we, Kentucky's water is in that Ohio River Basin. So all of the water within that white outline flows to one common location, and that is the Gulf of Mexico. So like 40% of the United States drains to that one location. And so if you think about all of the land uses, remember if it's on the ground, it's in your water, all the ways we use land there in, in that stretch of the United States, all of those land uses contribute to the quality of water that we have. And so when we, we have runoff from those land uses, we can get excess nutrients flowing into the Gulf of Mexico. And those excess nutrients, and so the map on the right in green shows runoff from farms. The red shows runoff from cities. So remember I was talking about that, um, you know, when we have excess fertilizer on our lawns, um, our pet waste, and then our sanitary sewer um, releases into our streams, then that's how our cities are also contributing um, to nutrients in the Gulf. And so we get this um, large hypoxic zone or a dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico that forms every summer. And so it, it's, I'll show you a picture of, this is what an algae bloom looks like. This is not the dead zone in the Gulf, but this is a, um, a pond here in central Kentucky that has too much nutrients. So you all know what this looks like. You see this in the landscape, the kind of funky stuff, you know, the algaes that are floating on the surface. Well, at a larger scale, we have that that happens in the Gulf of Mexico. And this is the dead zone. And so it's just where we have excess nutrients that are in the water. They um, cause um, algae blooms and aquatic life, the aquatic plant life to just go crazy and reproduce. But then as that sinks down into the water column and starts to decay, that decomposition um, process takes oxygen out of the water column and um, to decompose that material. And so now there's no oxygen available for fish and shellfish. 
So the red on this map that you're seeing is where we have dissolved oxygen that is less than two milligrams per liter. Um, so I guess I fibbed a little. This is a little bit of data. I know I said not too much data earlier, but um, so what we like to see for aquatic life, um, those to healthy aquatic life is around the eight to 10 milligrams per liter of dissolved oxygen. And when we get less than two, then things can't live there. So in 2017, this was the largest one that was measured. Um, and so it was about 5.6 million acres. And that's, that's pretty big. Um, and so we do have variability within years. Um, each year, there's a cruise of scientists that go out, and this isn't like a fun, this isn't your carnival party cruise. This is like a scientific cruise to uh, drop sensors down in the water, and they're measuring dissolved oxygen. So in 2020, it was down to, it was a smaller dead zone, and it was about 1.4 million acres, um, and it was smaller really due to mixing by Hurricane Hannah. And so, of course, this dead zone is subject to changes in what's coming down the Mississippi River and then also um, changes in uh, water currents as well. So a hurricane can help to churn that water up and break up that um, area of dissolved oxygen, of low oxygen. And I show you that because of these two fellas. And these are two um, shrimpers that I met a couple of years ago down in Mississippi. And these two gentlemen took us out to the docks where their family's boats are. And they walked us along these docks and said, you know, this boat hasn't been out in two years. This boat hasn't been out in three years. Um, these folks, you know, used to go out and we had this really great business. and. And now, you know, the, the shrimping and fishing market has been depressed in the Gulf because of the dead zone, the, the, you know, the bigger the dead zone, the farther out these shrimpers have to go to, to get their catch. And so, you know, that's gonna cost them more. And not only do they not have as many fish or shrimp they can catch, but they're smaller in size. And so it really does impact the local um, seafood market there on the Gulf. And so, you know, I just want us to see that because it's a good reminder for us to know that what we're doing here in Kentucky impacts someone else's livelihood downstream. And we would get pretty frustrated if we were on the receiving end of that as well. And so it's a good reminder to say, you know what, the things that I do impact somebody else. So, just keep in mind that when you're fertilizing the, the lawn, you're not just fertilizing the lawn. Um, when we're using, you know, excess nutrients to get our pretty green lawn, um, we have to remember that there's a consequence to that. So remember also, if it's on the ground, it's in your water. Okay, so now we've kind of set up the, you know, the, the downside of things. Well, let's talk about the upside of things because we're gonna leave you with ideas and ways that you can um, create a better system um, in your landscape. And so number one is to plant in the buffer zone. And so the buffer zone is that area of land adjacent to the stream. And, you know, I'm talking about putting trees there to create shading for the stream and moderate water temperature, shrubs, grasses, forbs, things that can help hold the soil in place on the stream bank and, and also help promote the ecology um, of the stream system. So stream buffers help to filter runoff water. They uptake excess nutrients, so that nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium from adjacent areas. They can protect stream banks from erosion. Um, they reduce flood damage, provide shade to streams, help wildlife. And personally, I think they look much more attractive than when we're mowing straight to the edge of the stream. So again, um, number two is don't mow in the buffer zone. And if you're not sure what that means, well then go back to number one. So don't mow in the buffer zone, but plant there. And here's a picture of a stream buffer and this poor little stream has a lot of problems going on. There's some erosion on the stream bank, there's trash in the stream, um, but we're also, when we mow that close to the stream, we're blowing clippings, grass clippings into the water. And that just adds to more of those nutrients getting in that we don't want in the water. Number three is to keep your septic system in good condition, if that's what you have, and watch what you flush. 
So I know this is not always the, the most fun conversation to have, um, but you know, things that to remember, um, the, the image on the right is, you know, sometimes things that get flushed that shouldn't get flushed. And so our little mantra is to remember that wipes clog pipes. So don't flush wipes. I know we have been sanitizing everything over the last year and oftentimes we use the toilet as the trash can, um, but make sure that only toilet paper and things that come out of your body go into the toilet. Um, next is to pick up litter and don't dump anything down storm drains. Storm drains drain directly to a stream, river, or lake. And so they're not treated. So don't dump anything into storm drains <clears throat> and make sure that you pick up litter. Even litter that seems like it's so far away from a water body, it's not gonna be a problem. It's really important to pick up litter and encourage other folks not to litter. Um, and either be part of a community cleanup or organize one yourself. We're moving into um, the spring and in April, we see lots of Earth Month or Earth Day activities. Organizing a community cleanup is a really easy way that you can help your water in your local waterway um, and you can also stay socially distant. Up next is don't change the path of streams. I know we're um, a lot of times we're really, um, you, sometimes we just think, gosh, I just want to move that creek. That little water body is just in my way. And so we push streams um, over to the edge of a, a field, or sometimes we pave right up to the edge and we just say, you know, stay right here in your banks. And unfortunately, we just mistreat our streams that way. And Mother Nature often wins out. No matter how much engineering we try to do, Mother Nature often wins anyway. So leave your stream path alone. Don't get into your stream with heavy equipment and decide you're gonna fix it. Um, you know, if you do have a major issue, it's important to get technical assistance before you do any work in your stream. Um, and last, but certainly not least, I encourage you to get outside and enjoy Kentucky's water resources. We are rich in water resources. Like we said before, we have over 90,000 miles of streams and rivers. You know, get outside and go paddling, um, enjoy the water, um, wade in it, fish in it, um, you know, sit in and just think about how lovely and what a wonderful resource it is. Being in green spaces is so good for our mental and emotional health. We all need some happy in our life right now. And being by a body of water, just it really can be um, a, a wonderful experience. So go out and enjoy Kentucky's water resources. Um, I'll leave you here again with the quote we started with, and that water is the most critical resource issue of our lifetime and our children's lifetime. The health of our waters is the principal measure of how we live on the land. So just keep that in mind that we're, everything that we're doing is gonna affect the next generation. So I'll remind you, if you need um, specific information about our waterways, you're, you can always contact your local extension office. You can drop me an email um, and we'll be happy to get you more information if you need that. Thanks, Amanda. That was awesome. I know I learned a ton in that. And we did have a few questions come in. so. First, uh, Bill Payne has asked for streams that don't um, support contact recreation. Is it still okay to wade in those or should we be cautious in those as well? Um, that's a good question. So if they don't support primary contact recreation, you just want to be super careful about getting water like kind of up above, um, you know, the chest area. Um, and, you know, um, you can look, I will say that you can look on the Kentucky Water Health portal. Um, I will um, drop that into the chat that um, let me see here. And, and you can get a kind of a report quickly of recent data and monitoring data that's um, available for certain stream segments. Um, you know, if you can, you know, wading in it, you're probably going to be fine. Um, I always am a little cautious. I have a six-year-old and it's hard to keep him out of a creek if there's one nearby. And I also don't want to take away that experience from him. I want him to appreciate the, the water bodies that we have. Um, 
And so I'm just really cautious about, you know, making sure that after he plays in the creek that he washes his hands really good and reminding kids, especially adults too, not to put your hands in your mouth after you've had your hands in the water. Um, so still okay to, to wade and, and be close to the water, just being cautious when you're in the water. Great. And we've had a couple of questions around kind of the use of fertilizers. You know, Rachel just submitted one um, asking about, does Kentucky have any programs for farmers to reduce the nutrient load that's being, you know, moved down to the Gulf? And that's a good question. We do have um, programs for farmers and um, the Natural Resources Conservation Service, as well as the Kentucky um, Division of Conservation and local conservation districts. Those two agencies um, offer um, cost share programs for farmers and farmers can um, sign up and participate with specific practices that will help reduce nutrients. We have assistance available also through um, through Division of Conservation and through Extension to help farmers with nutrient management planning, uh, meaning helping them to look at their um, soil tests and interpret those soil tests and help make recommendations for um, applications of nutrients. So um, we do have a lot of programs in Kentucky that are helpful to farmers. Great. And then for those of us that maybe do want those beautiful green lawns, but also want to be environmentally conscious, you know, are there, do you have recommendations? Is there, you know, something that we could request or buy, you know, if we use a service that we could request that they utilize or fertilizers that are maybe better than others that we could buy if we do our own application to kind of get the best of both worlds? Um, so if you do have a lawn service, or someone that's helping you with um, lawn applications, make sure you ask them to do a soil test and ask to see the results of the soil test. Um, you can also do that yourself. Um, and um, so take a soil sample, contact your local extension office, and you can drop those samples off. Some counties have assistance where that, that service is free. Otherwise, it's gonna be about six to $8 per sample, depending. Um, so it's a pretty inexpensive investment. Uh, we also have resources through our turf management program that recommend um, different mowing heights. So using a higher mowing height will often, um, the grass will shade out weeds. So you don't have the weed pressure um, and you still have that, that nice mowed lawn look. Um, in central Kentucky, you don't need phosphorus. We have plenty of phosphorus in our soils naturally and you don't need to pay for extra phosphorus fertilizer because really um, you're just increasing the risk of losing that back out into the stream. So those are a couple of things to think about, but certainly asking lots of questions of those who are taking care of your lawn. Great. And then we have a question here um, from Phyllis. It looks like, should Kentucky be encouraging the large greenhouses that use lots of water? Oh, that's a really good question and not a, an easy one to answer. Um, so, you know, I've been in conversation with some of our large greenhouse um, producers. Many of them use water collection systems. So they are collecting roof runoff and utilizing that in their irrigation um, systems as well. And so that honestly, it's a really smart thing to do because the, just the quantity of water used would be pretty expensive if you're buying municipal, municipally treated water. Um, so, you know, there's, there's, there's trade off though, right? Because now you have an impervious surface um, and depending on how they're used in, um, you know, what kind of fertilizer or what kind of production system they're using, you could have some soil residuals, you know, going on there. So, um, I don't know that I can say one way or the other on that, other than it is an alternative way to produce food. And, um, you know, I, I don't know that it's detrimental necessarily to water quality. Sure, sure. Uh, and then it looks like Julie has submitted a couple of questions here. One, is typhoid still a concern? And then two, is there, if you have a stream on your property, can you test it on your own? I don't know that typhoid is a concern, at least to my knowledge right now. Um, 
And then the second question is, if you have a stream on your property, can you test it yourself? Is mm -hmm. that right? Yeah. Um, the best way um, really to have your, your water quality tested is to, unless you're trained in how to use a, a field test kit, is to, to collect a, a sample and have it sent to a certified lab um, and get a report. But when you take that to a certified lab, they're gonna wanna know like what you want it tested for. So typically you would ask for things like pathogens, nutrients, um, you know, probably pH, um, dissolve, you know, other ions that might be there. Um, just keep in mind that when you do water sampling, it's a little different than soil sampling that water is passing through the system. So it is a point in time measurement. So keep that in mind, um, but you'll, you know, so maybe having multiple samples or samples monthly um, and to determine what your system looks like. Sure. And then Dave has a question about pond weed control. He says, most rates are in pounds or ounces per acre foot. How about if I'm doing a shoreline application, say 50 or 100 linear feet? How do you calculate the rate? Oh, Dave, you're going to make me do math. Well, I'm going <laughs> to save everybody the, from suffering through that. And I would just say we can kind of talk offline um, in terms of how to do your calculation for your volume there. Um, I know pond weeds are, um, they are, you know, a perennial problem, unfortunately. Um, and I'll say in generality, um, and I'm not a pond management person um, by any stretch. Um, we do have a pond management specialist who works here for Extension, um, and he's really great. Um, and he, um, but, you know, in general, trying to create that buffer zone around ponds is really important so that you're preventing nutrients from getting in the water because those, those, um, those weeds are going to feed on the nutrients that are getting into the water themselves. Creating some shade with larger trees can also help with that. Aeration is another solution. Um, and I just saw um, Zina mentioned that Watershed Watch will train you if you want to be a volunteer. Thanks for that reminder. Um, yes, so if you're interested in monitoring streams in your area, um, Kentucky Watershed Watch will train you and provide you a test kit to utilize throughout the, the summer season um, and help you understand what it means to use that and then um, what the results are too. Great, that's fantastic. And I think if anybody has any last questions, go ahead and submit those, but we have one more here. I'm interested in learning about any studies being done to monitor the microplastics and toxic compounds in the waterways and any data UK is gathering? Um, I am not aware of microplastic studies that are being done right now. Um, I know that that has been a concern and certainly, um, you know, I, I just don't know of any that are um, current. I would guess we probably have some researchers who are focused on that. Um, I know we have um, some researchers in engineering that um, are looking at membranes for filtration and filtration systems. And, and those a lot of times are really focused on nutrient and pathogen type filtrations. Um, but I would say, um, you know, moving along and into the future, um, there will be more research on microplastics. Great. Well, it looks like, actually it looks like Zina answered our other question about, you know, how quickly does a water sample have to get to a lab? It looks like it has to be kept cold and within six hours. So if anybody is doing their own sampling, there we go. So Amanda, I certainly appreciate your presentation today. As I said, I've learned a ton from this. I hope everyone, well, I'm sure everyone else on the call did as well. And thank you to all of our guests who joined us. Um, I hope everybody can make it again next month. We are having our next session on April 27th at 2 p.m. We're going to talk about the equine industry and we're going to go beyond just the racing in the equine industry. We have Dr. Cormac Bernock of Airdrie Stud is going to talk to us. Uh, he's also a member of our uh, Gluck Equine Foundation Board. And so he's going to share kind of some behind the scenes of what it's like to work on a farm, an equine farm every day. So I hope you guys can make it. And again, thanks for joining us today. And thanks, Amanda, for the presentation. Everybody have a good afternoon.